5G is being developed as a faster, smarter, and more efficient wireless network to help make a better connected society with self-driving cars, remote emergency surgery, and even sensors designed to protect the rainforest. The technology is still being developed and there's a great deal of work being carried out behind the scenes to make this vision a reality. In this two-part series of videos, we'll give a summary of some exciting research being carried out at the University of Exeter on the 5G network infrastructure. In this video, we'll discuss one of the important themes of this work known as network slicing. First, we need to understand what 5G actually is and what makes it different to 4G. 5G is the fifth generation mobile network which uses a larger frequency range of the electromagnetic spectrum compared to 4G. 4G goes from around 0.6 to 6 gigahertz and 5G will likely go from around 0.6 to 100 gigahertz. Future generations are called Beyond 5G or B5G and these might use frequencies above 100 gigahertz. Since 5G is using a larger frequency range, we'll need some new infrastructure, but crucially, the network has greater capacity for more users and devices. The challenge now is to make sure that the network itself can cope with the demands of all these new users and devices. For example, self-driving cars or equipment to use for remote surgery will need fast transmission of information. These devices will need a very low delay time or latency. Things like mobile phones, VR headsets or laptops might need a high bandwidth, which means more data being sent or received per second. In contrast, low energy devices like sensors, smart fridges or other Internet of Things devices have low data requirements, but they need many connections, maybe millions per square kilometre. Now, there are many different devices out there, but they tend to fit into different categories depending on their demands. So it makes sense that we virtually separate the different user types depending on what resources they need. And this is called network slicing. It's basically a way for the network providers to make sure that each user type has the right quality of service for their needs. Although network slicing makes things easier, it's still pretty challenging to share out resources to different slices. This is because the network will be really complex and it'll be changing constantly. Just think of how many users in each slice will be demanding different resources at different times. How do you process all those requests as quickly as possible? This is made even more challenging by privacy laws. Network providers aren't allowed access to your user requirements, so it's difficult to get accurate information about what resources are required and when. In addition, all these network resources are limited. You just can't give every device a super high bandwidth and low latency service. It would cost too much energy and too much money. These are three big challenges that network designers have to deal with when it comes to sharing out network resources. The usual method of sharing out resources can't easily adapt to a constantly changing network. It's time consuming and not very effective. We're going to need something a lot faster and a lot smarter. The researchers that we're working with at the University of Exeter are using AI and machine learning techniques to come up with a better way to share resources amongst network slices. Meet Dr. Yuli Wu, who is a lecturer and lead researcher on this project, and his colleague and postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Haozhuo Wang, who is an expert in machine learning techniques. I spoke to them to find out more. So Yuli, can you tell me why you decided to use machine learning to try to solve these problems? Why can't you just use a better algorithm to allocate resources? Uh, the main reason is because the network is really dynamic. Uh, it's constantly changing uh, due to the changing requirements of many different users and uh, applications. Uh, traditional algorithms are designed for a specific scenario or application and uh, do not tend to work well for constantly changing environments. Uh, the network system is constantly producing lots of useful data uh, that shows all these changes in real time. So we really need to use something that can learn from this data and uh, adapt with any changes. Uh, this is why machine learning is so useful. Uh, machine learning is a tool to learn knowledge from the data directly. You don't need to program it to uh, handle a specific scenario or uh, application. You just uh, show it data and uh, tell it what you are going to achieve with that data. 
It can also use that data to make predictions to some extent. And machine learning is able to uh, detect a change in the data in real time or near real time uh, and uh, can apply the uh, knowledge learned from this change to uh, allocate resources quickly. So uh, they meet the user application and the network requirements. Uh, so it's a, a good uh, way for the users who uh, get the network resources they need. It's also good for the network operators. Say if the service they provide is more reliable, then uh, they are fulfilling the requirements of their service level agreement, and uh, then they don't suffer a financial penalty. Hajia, we hear a lot about machine learning and deep learning. Can you first explain the differences between them? Okay, sure. Um, actually, people often get confused by these two buzzwords. Uh, but in fact, machine learning is a subset of AI or artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So it is also one of the most cutting edge machine learning techniques, and it involves sophisticated systems called artificial neural networks that mimic the operation of our brain. Uh, so they are capable of modeling and processing complicated relationships uh, between the inputs and the outputs. Um, actually, both concepts, machine learning and uh, deep learning, were actually developed in the late of uh, 1950s although in a very basic way. However, in recent years, uh, machine learning has been supercharged by the deep learning neural networks, uh, thanks to the development of the graphic cards or GPUs. So they offer the great ability to process the data in parallel. And so how does deep learning work? Uh, deep neural networks uh, have layers of neurons. So the input data will be processed by many layers until we get the art target we want. So deep learning falls under the group of techniques known as the feature learning, or we call it representation learning. So they are more suited to solving problems where previous knowledge of features is less desired or necessary, or where we don't have the labeled data sometimes. Okay, so basically you can give the deep learning algorithm a bunch of numbers and you tell it to do something with it. Um, you don't exactly need to explain what the numbers represent or how they're connected. It works that out for itself. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but not only for the numbers. Uh, it can also the input can also be photos or text. It's depending on what you are training it to achieve with your data. Uh, but in our work, we can't just use the deep learning on its own because we have a really complicated network uh, which keeps changing with time. Uh, so we are trying to design a network management system that not only can understand uh, what is going on in the network, but makes the best decisions uh, to optimize how the resources are allocated uh, in the network. So we use another machine learning technique called a deep reinforcement learning. And what is deep reinforcement learning and what's its relationship with deep learning? So to explain that, uh, firstly, uh, I would like to talk about uh, reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning where there's an agent learns to behave in an environment. So by performing certain actions and observing the rewards or penalties it gets from the actions, so it can improve itself. Uh, so to solve really complex tasks, where in our case, we have too many possible states in the network or too many actions. We need to combine the technique of reinforcement learning with deep learning. So we get deep reinforcement learning. And deep reinforcement learning can uh, already do some incredible things. You may have heard of uh, they can control the robot arms or they, the Google DeepMind's AlphaGo that have beaten the professional Go players. Uh, so the field of deep reinforcement learning has really exploded in recent years. Uh, so next, I think I will use our research work as an example to explain how deep reinforcement learning works. So uh, in deep reinforcement learning, we have four essential elements, the agent, uh, environment, 
action and the reward. So the agent in our system is the network management system we want to train. So it aims to share out resources in network slices most effectively. And the environment is the world in which the agent performed actions. So in our case, uh, the environment is the whole network, including the physical infrastructures and also all the network slices. So an action here uh, is a move made by the agent. So it can change the environment to a new state. Uh, in our work, so the actions are the decisions on how to allocate network resources effectively. So finally, we have the rewards. So the rewards tell the agent how well it's uh, it uh, action is. So did the user get the resources it needed or how effectively was it shared among the network slices? So we have the reward to address that and give feedback to the agent. And of course, we have to use some also some mathematical tools uh, to actually describe this action reward repeat looping learning process. So we frame it as a Markov decision process. Uh, so which is uh, also a common technique in reinforcement learning uh, when we're dealing with similarly random data. So Yuli, besides deep reinforcement learning that you're currently using for solving resource allocation problems, what other machine learning models are you using and what other problems are you trying to address with this technology? Uh, right, okay. So uh, many traditional machine learning or deep learning models uh, can only handle the data with a regular structure, such as the two-dimensional image and the one-dimensional uh, text data. Uh, we call this type of data Euclidean data uh, because you can effectively represent it as an evenly spaced grid of numbers, uh, although sometimes with three or more dimensions. Uh, for more complicated data structures, uh, we are using a graph neural network or we call GNN. Uh, that is a type of deep learning model, uh, but uh, uh, it's different in the fact that it can process non-Euclidean data. So it's able to solve many real world problems uh, which cannot be represented uh, in this simple uh, grid-like uh, structure. Uh, the network data is not Euclidean data, so we are currently using GNN to develop more accurate uh, digital twins for computer and communication networks. Okay, and a digital twin, and that's like a really accurate computer model of the network? Uh, right, uh, yes, it is. And uh, these GNN-based digital twins uh, can then be used to address many challenging problems of computer networks or critical infrastructures. Uh, such as quickly detecting anomalies uh, or attacks. Great, fantastic. Thanks very much, Yuli and Haozhou. It's really great to hear about your work. So it seems that deep reinforcement learning could be really useful for network slicing because it can keep learning and improving how resources are shared out in this complex and constantly changing network. We hope you've enjoyed this video. To find out more about this research, click on the link in the description and subscribe or follow us on social media for updates from the Exeter Science Centre.